wait a couple couple additional mi minutes for folks to get into the webinar and just to remind folks that we have um, a few more webinars over the next couple of weeks and all exciting topics. Um, Andre Brito from UNH and Horacio Vilgas from the University of Wisconsin. They're gonna be talking about greenhouse gas emissions on organic dairies next week. And I know some folks um, worked with Horatio and his team in Wisconsin uh, in collaboration with Organic Valley looking at life cycle analysis of different nutrients on organic farms. So it'll be exciting to hear about that project. And I believe Andre is gonna focus a bit on feeding um, management to, I don't wanna say reduce greenhouse gases, but let's say manage them. And um, following that, we're gonna hear from Glenda Pereira, who is now at the University of Maine. And she's the new dairy specialist there, which we're all excited to have her here. Um, she, I think maybe if you were on the webinar Wednesday, Marcia had uh, mentioned that she, Glenda, um, was at the University of Minnesota working with her and some others, Brad Hines, who we had um, have had here giving webinars before. And so now Glenda is a dairy specialist in Maine. So we'll get to hear from her next week, which we're excited about. And then we'll wrap up the series with Jen Miller and Sarah Flack talking about the cost of production studies for organic and grass fed systems. And I know many of you have been involved with those um, cost of production studies with our team and with NOFA for many years. So an, an update really on um, what the numbers look like. So it, it's been interesting to all of us to be comparing the cost of production between organic um, and organic grass-fed dairies. So hopefully you can join us for those last few webinars. So today you're gonna hear from Sarah and I. Sarah Ziegler is um, a research specialist here at UVM with UVM Extension. And I know many of you have worked with Sarah, um, certainly seen her around at all of our different events and um, have worked with her on various research projects as well. And, and Sarah is really leading the charge on much of our grass-fed dairy work and also heavily involved in our forage trials. And so today she's gonna be giving us a, an update um, on some of the research we've been doing, you know, really focused on perennial forages. And then I'll follow Sarah and um, just highlight a couple of the research projects that we have going on or have just finished up. Really, um, we, we have a lot of information to share. And that was <laughs> what I was saying to Sarah. It's, oh, how do you even choose what to share with everybody in a really short period of time? And so we're, we'll type our website or maybe Susan can into the chat box. And I would really encourage everyone to, to go to our website. Um, we post all of our research results from, I would say about 95% of all of our research trials every single year. So we're in the midst of that right now, compiling all the results, trying to get the information out to all of you folks. And we post it on our website under the uh, research reports. And the great thing is that you can go back in time, you can look at reports, I wanna say, I don't know, from way back, <laughs> before 2012. So there is a lot there, but um, a lot of really great information. And you know, we don't nearly have time today to talk about all of it, but I would encourage folks to um, go there and, and find out more, or just follow up with us. All right, so with that, Sarah, I'm gonna, turn it over to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and have you take the driver's seat. Sure. Thanks, Heather. Let me just get this up there. All right. You guys see my PowerPoint now? 
Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Heather. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. Like Heather mentioned, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of our perennial grass and legume trials that we've had going on up at Border View Research Farm in Alberg. And I just wanted to start out by looking at this daunting graph of weather data that we've collected from up there. Um, obviously, you guys have all been experiencing um, a more erratic climate the last couple of years being exceptionally dry, at least where we were. I know last year some folks got a bit more rainfall in July. We just got the cooler weather, but no rainfall. And so really just thinking about if we're faced with less consistent rainfall and these sort of long exterior extended periods of drought, what kind of pressure your perennial forages are under. You know, we here in the Northeast are relying on cool season perennial forages that really thrive in cooler conditions and um, moister conditions and really go dormant and pretty unproductive in that summer slump time. And so just again, framing sort of the challenges that we're up against looking for um, varieties and species and mixtures and management practices that help us combat these really challenging conditions so that through those really tough times, you still have enough dry matter and enough decent quality forage to make it through. And so, you know, when we think about sort of resiliency through those periods, what we're looking for are species and varieties that can withstand those bad periods, but are really good in the good times, right? It's like, no matter what, they're, they're going to they're gonna hold up. And so this is just looking at some um, meadow fescues, orchard grass, and timothies um, in their sort of average dry matter yield in a cut in 2017 when conditions were um, pretty wet and much better for growing forages, um, cool season perennial forages compared to 2020, which was exceptionally dry um, and hot. And so you can see the blue bars are that, that yield in 2017, the orange is the 2020. And then in the orange bar, that percentage is the percentage um, of that dry matter yield in 2020 as compared to 2017. So, you know, this meadow fescue here, what we're saying is meadow fescue produced only about 50% um, of its yield uh, in a dry year compared to its yield in a wet year. So orchard grass with 61% held up much better in those dry conditions and Timothy a bit less than that, but still a bit better than meadow fescue. So again, just trying to consider um, what's, what's gonna hold up through those variable conditions. So this crazy graph, <laughs> I'll try to walk you through it. Um, this is our perennial grass variety trial data from 2020 and 2021. That trial was just established um, in late summer 2019. So this is really the first data that we've been getting in from this trial. And unfortunately, both years have been exceptionally dry. And I say unfortunately, but really fortunately, I think for us, we get to see those really challenging conditions and what is going to hold up under those really hot, really dry, um, unideal conditions. And so this graph on the bottom, you can see the variety names are right up next to the axis, but then below these are grouped by species. So like these three, Macbeth, Fleet, and Montana are all varieties of meadow brome. There's two varieties of Kentucky bluegrass. We have meadow fescues, orchard grass, perennial ryegrass, and timothies. And then the yields per cutting, the blue bars are the first cut stacked on top are the second, third, and fourth cutting. Um, we were able to take a fourth cutting in 2020, but not in 2021. Um, so some of them you'll see don't have those yellow bars. Um, they just weren't harvested in 2020. Um, and so you can see two things on these graphs. One, you can see just overall yield, right? If we just look at the total height of the bars, by species, you can see some differences, but then also if we look within each of these species, we see differences by variety, right? So there's this this um, variety of uh, meadow brome that produced about five and a half tons compared to this Montana that produced just over four, right? And so we can do that for each of these um, species. But then the other thing that you can see is also some of the distribution throughout the season, right? So um, for instance, the orange bars are that second cut, right? In most of these, they're pretty small. 
But when we look at perennial ryegrass, a much more, and Timothy, right, a much more substantial portion of their total dry matter was being produced in those second cuttings. So um, just wanted to point this out, you know, we don't necessarily have statistical differences shown here, but a lot of times uh, we hear from producers that say, well, you know, I have whatever has been growing out in my fields. It's been there for who knows how 50 years or more, you know, it's, it's what's growing the best. I'll just leave it. It seems to be doing fine. But, you know, what if that's, what if this is the variety that's sitting out there, right? What you could be getting much more um, yield out of that. And also just thinking about um, if that's going to continue holding up for you going into, um, you know, some more and more challenging climate um, change scenarios. So what I was talking about with the distribution a minute ago, it is a bit easier to see in this graph. And so now we're just looking at each of the colored lines as a different species. So you can see up at the top here, which ones are which. Um, and this is just for 2020. Um, and then we have the four cuttings that we took in 2020 across the bottom. And the y-axis is the proportion of the total dry matter throughout the season for each cut. So um, for instance, we can look first at Kentucky bluegrass here, right? This is saying about 75% of the total yield for the season of that Kentucky bluegrass was in the first cut. And then it drops down to you know 15% and then declines from there. And so what I think is interesting here to note is that in general, with our cool season perennial grasses, we would say, you know, our highest yields are coming from our, our first cuttings, right? And then we know we hit the summer slump and they all sort of decline. Um, and then they tend to rebound a bit, not, not as high um, as the first cut, but rebound a you know, higher than the second cut in the third and, and fourth, if there is one. Um, and in general, if you look at a couple of the bars here, the gray line is meadow fescue, the yellow is orchard grass, and the darker blue is meadow brome. And those three really do, oops, there's my cursor, <laughs> really do follow that where they're highest in the first, declining in the second, and then rebounding a bit in the third and fourth. But then if you look again at Kentucky bluegrass that we were mentioning, right? pretty much all of its dry matter was in that first cutting. And then after that, it just did not, it was not able to recover from that, that harvest in under those really hot dry conditions. And it just, you know, basically disappeared over the rest of the season. So you really got one cutting out of that. Um, and then if we take a look at the green line, this is Timothy, you know, we see a much more gradual decline over the entire season, um, leaving more of that dry matter being produced in that second cut when everything else is tanking. And similarly, this blue line here is perennial ryegrass, um, which, you know, we don't always recommend here. Um, it really depends on where you are at in the state, um, you know, what your elevation is, what your um, you know, your, your particular microclimate offers in terms of its uh, ability to overwinter in areas where there's a bit more snow cover um, and it can be a bit more protected. It, it tends to do pretty well, like up in the Northeast Kingdom, but um, we tend not to have it here in the Champlain Valley overwinter very well because we tend to get, you know, freezing and thawing in the middle of the winter and ice sheeting and all that kind of jazz that um, seems to do a number on it. Um, but we actually had really great success with it overwintering, which is funny. Um, but, you know, so you can see here, oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, this perennial ryegrass really produced pretty much, you know, 35 to 45% of its dry matter in both the first and the second cuttings. And then it sort of petered out from there. So again, just thinking about what your needs are throughout the season, what you currently have out in your fields. And if any of these species offer an opportunity to sort of fill in those gaps to make sure that you get through those really challenging periods in the summer, which seem to be getting longer <laughs> um, and, and just more difficult to deal with. So, so far I've only been talking about dry matter yield and I know it's not all about yield. It's really a balance between yield and quality, right? Cause you need both the quantity and the quality of forage um, to make it through those, make it through the season. And so, like Heather was mentioning, we have all of the nitty gritty details in each year um, annual research report on our website, so you can go check that out. But this table on the right was taken from that report. This is just comparing the species um, in over, overall season dry matter yield and then particular um, 
quality parameters. And what I just wanted to point out was another way to look at this data. You know, we see from this table, we can see some very substantial um, dry matter yield differences, right? Orchard grass producing six tons of dry matter throughout the year compared to meadow fescue, only producing, you know, just over four and a quarter. Um, and then some pretty big quality differences, right? Like perennial ryegrass, the tried and true <laughs> rocket fuel that everybody talks about, right? Way higher water soluble carbohydrate content um, than the other species. But when you consider the yield differences, you know, I guess I would just um, mention that it's, it's, you want to consider both, right? So I think an, an easier way to look at this would be looking at the yield of each of these components um, on a per acre basis, right? Because you may have something that's high yielding and lower quality, but at the end of the day, having that extra dry matter at that sort of moderate level of quality may still get you um, more than you would if you put in um, something that supposedly would have higher quality, but it just doesn't yield for you. So this table on the left side, you can see also has more detail because I put in all of the varieties for you as well. Um, which you can take a closer look at if you, uh, when we put these presentations up online. Um, and these we didn't run statistics on or anything, but again, just pointing out um, like meadow fescue, for instance, if you look over in the table on the right, had statistically similar water soluble carbohydrate content as perennial ryegrass. Um, it also had statistically similar um, yields, but look at the difference in the average water soluble carbohydrate content um, per acre, right? And so there are some pretty significant varietal differences out there as well. Um, so just something to consider. I also have, you know, protein and um, digestible uh, fiber at 48 hours in there. So just something to consider thinking about both yield and quality when you're selecting a variety and a species. Um, I just wanted to show some pictures, which I think really show um, what was going on out in the field um, when it was so hot and so dry this past season. So these were taken in about August, mid-August maybe. Um, and just comparing here, we have two of the different varieties of perennial ryegrass, right? And the one on the left has basically dried up. <laughs> it's, it really hasn't regrown. You can see you can see where a little bit of the green um, in the lines of, of uh, the, you know, where it's planted is kind of coming back, but it, it's basically dried up. Um, and compared to the one on the right, that is much more dark green, it's regrown, it's nice and lush. Um, so pretty substantial difference there in what these varieties were able to do given the same, you know, same conditions, same nutrients, same limited water capacity, all of that. So here's also, again, two varieties of meadow bromes. So this variety on the left, Montana, it's pretty thin. You can see it's like a very pale green color um, and really has hardly done anything since the last cutting. Whereas this variety fleet on the right, a lot more biomass, really nice and dark green um, and ready to harvest again. Last one, this variety Hussar. Orchard grass looks like it's hardly done anything. <laughs> um, maybe regrown an inch or, inch or so since the last cutting. This other variety, Innovale orchard grass, was just phenomenal. Huge, huge amounts of biomass, nice and dark green. Clearly, there are differences in these uh, varieties' ability to find and utilize limited resources of water and nutrients um, and all of those resources to be be able to be putting into um, dry matter production throughout the year. So um, this is another photo that I took of these uh, perennial grass trials that we have, but this one's a little bit different and is gonna move us into the next discussion that I wanted to have about um, nitrogen. And what you can see in this photo is these dark green patches where obviously we have applied some nitrogen. And even in this really dark brown, <laughs> crispy section here, which was Kentucky bluegrass that had pretty much just fried up, um, where we applied the nitrogen, you could, you could see a very clear response where the grass was growing um, and getting dark green. But 
And I'm sure everybody's had that experience where you either go out and put uh, poultry manure down or you spread some liquid manure and, you know, something with very soluble nitrogen. Um, and you and you see that that really like nice lush green response. Um, but right now, fertilizer prices are pretty high. Uh, if you're organic, you're already pretty limited in what you can apply. And all the time we get questions about whether or not it's worth it to put um, the nutrients down, what's the best thing to put down. And really it's super challenging with nitrogen because nitrogen is so volatile in the, its availability um, being really driven by microbial activity and moisture and temperature. Um, and even if you have nitrogen lurking around, right? It's gotta be, you know, if it's in organic forms, it's being mineralized by those microbes. It also has to make it into the soil solution to be able to take up by the plants. So it's very complex. It's, it's really hard to predict. And so that's why we don't um, make a nitrogen recommendation or test for nitrogen, sorry, on a regular soil test. And our recommendations are actually just um, pretty much based on what your yield goal will be um, and, you know, maybe a bit about like what generally what type of soil you're on getting at that, um, idea of, of how much, uh, microbial activity you have, but really we don't have very nuanced nitrogen recommendation, um, systems for perennial grasses. Like we do, you know, like a PSNT test that we have for corn, where you could test for nitrate availability in the soil. And we very, you know, have pretty good data to say what the response would be um, and therefore can you know back calculate how much nutrients you'll need to apply to be able to get that crop to your yield goal. Um, we don't really have that for perennial grasses, and so it's pretty challenging um, to to know whether or not you're going to sort of get that return out of that nitrogen. So this is just some research. This is not our research. This is from uh, USDA ARS in North Carolina. Um, and they were sort of interested in this topic and wondering if soil biological activity as a measure in the soil that you would test for, and this idea of the cost um, versus the value of the cost of the fertilizer versus the value of um, forage that you could purchase to replace that yield, if those two things could provide a better um, in-season recommendation for nitrogen. And really what this was based on is this graph that you can see up in the top right, where they saw they were tracking soil test biological activity and the, on the uh, x-axis. And on the y, you can see plant available nitrogen in the soil. And so they see this very strong um, positive association where as soil test biological activity increased, they were getting more plant available nitrogen, right? And that makes perfect sense. That's what we were saying. The more active your soil is, the more that those microbes are able to mineralize the nitrogen that is around in, um, in organic forms and make that available to your plants. And so they were really wondering if you could use this um, and testing for soil, soil test biological activity um, to sort of make a judgment of whether or not you would have enough nitrogen be available for your crop or not. Um, and then with this idea of these cost versus value um, thresholds, then you'd be able to make a, a decision of if that was also going to be an economical decision or not. And so the, I just have the examples here. They were looking at low, a low, medium, and high cost threshold being five to one, 10 to one, and 20 to one. And here's just an example of what that um, calculation would mean. They're saying um, if a pound of nitrogen was 94 cents a pound and you could purchase a ton of forage for 150 bucks a ton, then that's a roughly a 12 and a half to one um, ratio. And so what the researchers did is in, I think it was like four different states in the South, like Georgia um, and North and South Carolina, they had 92 different field sites where they were looking at stockpiled tall fescue, right? This is tall fescue land down in the South. And they were applying no additional nitrogen, 40, 80, or 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And they tested the soil for this soil test biological activity beforehand. Um, and then harvested the stockpiled forage when it was ready to harvest. And what they found was that only 30% of the fields saw a positive yield response that would meet that low five to one 
um, cost value threshold. Only 14% of those fields saw a positive response at the medium threshold, and none of the fields would have met that higher threshold. And they only saw positive um, yield responses um, that were economical when the soil bi biological activity was really low. So basically what they were saying was if you were able to test your soil and you had moderate to high biological activity in that soil, it would not be economical unless you had exceptionally <laughs> cheap um, uh, fertilizer, you know, nitrogen costs or, or, or forage was, you know, not available or very, very expensive um, in your area, it wouldn't be economical to add nitrogen. You wouldn't get a, a high enough yield response um, to make that worth it. And only in situations where that activity in the soil, the biological activity was really low, um, would it potentially be economical to add any nitrogen. So we've been fiddling around a little bit with stockpiling forage. We're getting some questions about people interested in, in knowing how it works here um, and if it's uh, a valuable option for extending the grazing season. Um, but so we're kind of curious, looking at that past research, it looks like it's probably not always that economical to add nitrogen. But we know grasses are pretty heavy feeders of nitrogen, right? And we don't want to just have stands of pure grasses. So we were curious, uh, how does stockpiling work here in the Northeast with some, you know, other more traditional or more common varieties here like orchard grass? Um, and could we replace that nitrogen fertilizer with legumes? Would that be sufficient to feed that grass rather than relying on um, purchased fertilizer? And so we had a trial that we just put in um, in 2020. And so this past year was our first harvest of it. So this is some very new data that we haven't even finished fully processing. So I've put a little bit of it here today, but you'll have to stay tuned and check our website for more um, information for the full report. But you can see in the table what our treatments were. We used orchard grass, orchard grass tall fescue mix, and tall fescue. And then within each of those grasses, we applied either 40 pounds of nitrogen using urea in early August, that same 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre with urea in late August, mixed the grass with alfalfa, mixed the grass with red clover, or just had the grass planted by itself with no additional nitrogen added. And as I said, those, these plots were planted in the spring of 2020 um, and were just maintained as a new seeding through that year. And then in 2021, we harvested those plots twice where we didn't collect any yields. Um, we just mowed them off um, when we were harvesting our other perennial grass trials that I was just talking about. And then the biomass was left to accumulate after late July. And then that stockpiled forage was harvested in early November. And so I have two tables here that I pulled together for you. The top one is just comparing the grass species. So you can see orchard grass, the orchard grass tall fescue mix, and the tall fescue. So it, I thought it was pretty interesting that we, we seemed to get a benefit from um, adding in orchard grass and, and um, you know, tall fescue didn't produce that, that high of biomass um, compared to the orchard grass or the orchard grass tall fescue mix. So the orchard grass seems to do um, pretty well in comparison to tall fescue. Um, for stockpiled yield. Overall, we were averaging about a ton of dry matter um, accumulated during that time. And then if you look in this bottom table, we, this is looking by the nitrogen treatments. So this is the early applied nitrogen, the late applied nitrogen, mixed with alfalfa, mixed with clover, or no additional nitrogen. And what's interesting here is basically you can see that the yield, right, 0 0.607 tons per acre with just grass and nothing else applied, the yields doubled pretty much um, with any nitrogen treatment. And really there's not much of a difference between using alfalfa or clover compared to applying that 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre with urea. So, you know, I think this is really showing us the value of integrating legumes into these grass mixtures, um, even if we're, um, you know, you're able to, to at least, uh, you know, get the same yields. Oops, sorry, there's my cursor. <laughs> uh, 
um, just in, in integrating a, an inner seeding and a alfalfa or a clover into those um, grass mixes. There we go. So I know everybody <laughs> always says, you know, well, frost seeding doesn't really work. I don't really see any a difference and my legumes are out there, but this value of legumes is, isn't something we can ignore, especially on organic, um, inorganic systems. You know, we, we're not gonna be able to feed those pure grass stands um, without them. They can really provide a substantial portion of that nitrogen that the grass needs, but they have to be there in a substantial amount, right? So, you know, more than 30% of the composition out there in your fields should really be legumes. Um, if not more. And they don't just hang out forever. <laughs> you know, you do have to manage them. You either have to be reseeding them um, regularly or managing them um, to self-seed, right? Like delaying mowing until some of those, you know, red clover goes to seed and, and then they can persist. But when we suggest that folks, you know, go and reseed and we hear that you know, they didn't think that anything happened, I would also just caution you that you, you know, have taken the right steps to, to set yourself up for success ahead of time, right? So frost seeding really uh, works best when you have open spaces, right? Especially if you're just broadcasting it versus using a, a no-till drill. You're asking that seed that you're just throwing out there to make it through that canopy and then hit the soil and then start to, you know, have everything it needs to grow. So, you know, if you if there are fields that you're looking at improving um, the legume content, you know, graze them or mow them close in the fall where you're, you know, where you're intending to seed so that you can start to open that canopy up, um, you know, get all of your equipment and your seed ready as soon as possible so that you're ready as soon as those, you know, freezing and thawing conditions um, are happening so that you don't miss that window. Because sometimes, you know, uh, as I've, I'm sure everybody has seen in the last week, how variable our weather here can be, you know, it can go from everything's frozen to everything's completely thawed um, pretty quickly. And so that, that sort of sweet spot window um, can be pretty tight sometimes. So be, really be ready. Um, and then also, you know, again, once you throw that seed out there and it makes its way down to the soil, it's got to have everything it needs to grow. So if you have, you know, some underlying uh, pH or other fertility issues, those need to be corrected ahead of time. Legumes in particular, you know, really want a pH that's, you know, in the mid to upper six um, range. Um, and have a pretty high demand for boron and potassium and other micronutrients. And so, you know, really making sure, not just for your legumes, for your grasses as well, but especially if you're trying to get new species to establish in that sort of competitive environment, they, they also will not be able to contend with not having um, all of the, the right fertility there. And then the last thing I would say about it is just be dedicated to it. You know, it's, it's a slow process. You don't see improvement right away, but it is happening and every little bit helps. You know, I think about the, the many little hammers approach, right? So you put out some seed each year on some fields. And if you've done everything right to make sure that the, you're, you know, as successful as you can be, you will be making a difference um, over time. And even if every little step, you know, doesn't do a huge amount by itself. Okay, so like I had mentioned, you the legumes, you know, don't won't won't persist forever by themselves. And so this is just some data from a legume variety trial that we had. Um, this is data from 2019 and 2020. And this trial was um, established in 2017. And so especially, um, you know, things like red clover is generally pretty short lived. And so unless you're managing it um, for reseeding or you are reseeding it, it will decline over time. And so what we did in this trial was as this trial was ending its, um, you know, near the end of its stand life, we went out and we collected biomass in each of the plots where we then separated the, uh, the legume that was supposed to be there from anything else, grass, weeds, whatever else was growing there. And so what you see is the blue bars is the 
the percent of dry matter of the total dry matter that is alfalfa in 2019, red clover in 2019, bird's foot trefoil and white clover. And then the orange bars is what was left in 2020. And so really you can see alfalfa 2019 and 2020 after a few years of being harvested multiple times a year was still about 70% alfalfa. So we had some weeds, some grass, you know, some other stuff moving in, but it was pretty much still mostly alfalfa. Whereas the red clovers had declined to about 60% and under 50% by 2020. And our bird's foot trefoil sadly <laughs> did not do very well um, and was basically gone by 2020. Um, and similarly white clover also declining. And so there's a few things that were going on in this trial that led to the demise of some of these um, species. So like I said, they were harvested three times a year. Um, we also, we experienced some pretty significant um, winter kill. Again, we tend to have some pretty variable winter conditions that can, you know, lead to uh, thawing and then freezing again and, and sheeting of ice and things like that that can do a number on um, some of these species. We also then had very dry years um, and with harvesting you know, three times, we were harvesting them all at the same time. So some of these species, you know, may want longer recovery periods in those situations and um, therefore were declining over time when harvested regularly. And one of the major things we saw was potato leaf hopper pressure. And so the bottom, you can see, these are some photos from that particular trial. You can see it's some alfalfa and um, white clover. And the picture all the way to the right here is the, you know, sort of more severe potato leaf hopper damage that we see where you can see that yellowing along the margin, those brown tips. Um, and so that was also contributing to some of these uh, persistence issues. And so related to that, I was just wanted to show you one of these graphs, which I think Heather's going to go into a little bit more detail on this particular trial. But just again, thinking about all of the different um, tools that you have in your toolbox to to get the most out of your perennial forage stands. And one of the things that I would, you know, um, hope that you would consider is the di diversity, right? Being a tool, right? These varietal differences can be tools for you, for you to use um, to make sure that you have the most resilient um, stand that you possibly can, right? And so we were just talking about potato leaf hopper damage and these two photos here, you can see the one on the left is nice and green. One on the right has pretty severe potato leaf hopper burn. Um, and the difference here is that this variety on the left is a potato leaf hopper resistant variety, right? It basically has a much hairier um, leaves and stems that the potato leaf hoppers don't prefer to feed on and can't really feed as easily. So they go for the, the smooth, um, smooth varieties and just decimate them. And so this graph up at the top of the page um, is showing you the yields over two different cuttings of these four different diversity treatments. So the very low was basically one variety of one species all the way up to very high. That was a very complicated mixture of multiple species and multiple varieties. And really what you can see here is Although both treat, you know, all the treatments decline from this like first cutting to the second, as we'd expect, that decline was much more severe where you had low, very low or low diversity compared to high or very high diversity. And so again, just thinking about um, ways to enhance your resilience to all sorts of different conditions, you know, putting a lot of different characteristics out in the field through species and varieties can help you sort of weather those storms and get through with the most um, yield and quality forage that you need to get through the year. So that's all I have. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and pass it back over Sarah. to Heather. Yeah, let me get my screen up. There's some question it, questions in the um, chat about you know legumes and actually um, alfalfa is definitely more drought tolerant than the other legumes um, has you know that sort of deep deep tap root um, has you know has a different growth habit and I think for us 
up at border view it's really shined um i wouldn't say the uh soils there are are stony but but they can be they can be very um bony and there's some clay and there's some some loams you know probably like every farm in the northeast a, a pretty large diversity of of soil types and i feel like wherever we've put the legume trial over the years especially during those dry years you know it's the alfalfa that continues to um produce for us so all right um, let me get this up here share so i'm gonna try to pick up where Sarah left off and Sarah, you can, you can go with the questions in the chat box now. <laughs> um, it's great. Just keep asking them and, and we'll keep answering them to the best of our ability. But I wanted to pick up where Sarah left off on this, um, this experiment we had, we called it the fire trial. It was in collaboration with Cornell. It wrapped up um, not, not in 20, it wrapped up in 2020. And really sort of the goal of this project was to look at diversity levels, both by variety and species in annual and perennial forage systems. So I know there was a little bit of um, chatter in, in the chat around diversity. You know, we, we were showing these monoculture experiments that we're doing, right? Looking at grass species, individual you know legume species and varieties and just trying to get a sense of how they grow how they grow on their own it's a lot more complex to do that when you you know throw in 30 other things in the mix not that that's not ultimately what we want people to do but to get a sense of how you know a meadow brome or meadow fescue performs on its own under you know a certain soil type Again, it's it's easier to to do that separately, but ultimately, as has been mentioned in in the chat, we want diversity out in those fields um, in our perennial forages. And this experiment really helped us look at that. And um, here, all the treatments is pretty complicated, as you can see. We had perennial system treatments, and then we had annual forage treatments. And the annual forages. The cropping system combined both cool season forages with annual uh, warm season forages. So we grew the cool season, then we grew the warm season as one cropping system. So you can see in the perennial system, the very low diversity treatment was just one variety of alfalfa. And then the low diversity treatment was still just alfalfa but a bunch of different varieties of alfalfa. And then we made the systems more complex. So we had a high diversity and a very high diversity treatment. So you can see with high, we had alfalfa and white clover and a couple of different types of grasses, but one variety of each. And then in the very high system, we had those same species, but with four varieties each. So you can see we built on that diversity and we wanted to see you know, how these systems yielded, what were the benefits of having more or less diversity. And we did the same thing with the annual treatments. Um, the cool se season treatment was just one variety of triticale, low was four varieties, and then we sort of built different levels of diversity by adding in different cool season uh, forage treatments. And we tried to add legumes into this system as well. And then you can see with the annual uh, warm season, we had one variety of Sudan grass, then four varieties, and then we were combining Sudan grass uh, with millets, et cetera, and increasing the number of varieties to see how these would perform. All right, so in 2017, you can see the very low perennial system, which was one variety of alfalfa and the low system, yielded almost, well, not a half, but at least 30% less than the high diversity, right? And the very high diversity. High and very high were the same, at least statistically in terms of yield. But this was 
really critical, right? We got basically an additional ton of feed when we had that diversity in there. In this case, it was the grasses, right? We had a grass um, alfalfa mix and white clover as well. When we just had alfalfa, what ended up happening in 2017, which Sarah already mentioned, we had a terrible leafhopper outbreak. And you can see that with just one variety of alfalfa that was not leafhopper resistant, we, our yields really suffered. And you can see where they suffered was in that second cut. We were actually only able to get a couple of cuts because of that severe damage. If we didn't have that grass, really, we wouldn't have barely gotten a second cut at all. So diversity in a perennial system is really important because of diseases, because of the weather that we experience and the variability in that. We know that adding more diversity, legumes and grasses um, is going to be, it already is important, but increasingly important, especially as the climate becomes more erratic. We didn't really see any benefit necessarily from adding lots and lots of spe species and varieties. And the cost of doing that, the complexity of doing that anyway is probably not feasible or practical, but adding the grass and the legume, you know, again, gave us a ton more feed in a year where we had some weather issues. Now, the annual treatments was a, a whole different story. With the annual forages, and you can see here, this combines the cool with the warm season. So the green is the cool season forages, and then the blue and the orange are the first and second cut, the warm season uh, for annual forages. And in, in this system, at least for yields, the diversity didn't really give us a yield benefit. It didn't give us a yield benefit. Um, and you can see, you know, if we had one variety of triticale, four varieties of triticale, um, or, you know, and the Sudan grass, or we had lots of different types, we didn't see any additional yield bump from doing that. Now, that's not to say there um, aren't other benefits, but I think for most of us, we want high yields and high quality. Um, and you can see here, we had really high yields, you know, this is 12,000 pounds of dry matter, you know, so six tons with this combined system, and in some cases, even higher. So again, if you're looking for more feed, more forage, these warms, um, warm and cool season annual cropping systems can really increase uh, forage production on a farm. So again, this is 2017 yields, just showing the perennial system treatment and the annual system treatment kind of side by side. And you can see in this year, again, when we had alfalfa and grass mix, this high and very high diversity, we basically got about three tons of feed. And in the annual system in this particular year, we were getting six tons of feed. Um, not to say that you should be doing one or the over the other as far as annual versus perennial, but again, just to show you the amount of biomass and yield that you can get if you want to incorporate some of these annual forages into your cropping system. All right, so here's 2018, which was a different year, right? A totally um, you know, different story. It was much warmer in 2018, actually, you know, quite a bit warmer. The moisture levels were, you know, on average for the most part. And you can see that that very low diversity um, didn't yield any different than the high diversity treatment. And it, in fact, we actually saw a slight, you know, yield decline um, from having too, too much diversity compared to having, you know, these different um, uh, varieties of alfalfa. So, you know, in a second year, having just alfalfa out in the field worked out, right? But we know, and Sarah said the same thing, we know what we're trying to do is 
hedge, hedge the risk, you know? And so we know that not every year is gonna be a great year for alfalfa or even a great year for grass or red clover. And so how do we mix the right varieties um, in combinations that provide us that kind of resiliency um, the best that we can against the weather or with, with the weather, let's say that instead of against. And you can see in 2018, very similar uh, here again with, you know, just having triticale in that field, one variety, we were able to obtain seven tons of dry matter and in combination with the Hay King Sudan grass that was harvested twice. So adding diversity in this annual system, um, again, didn't really impact the yields. So we didn't gain anything yield-wise from doing that. And again, this is just, it's a lot of data. Um, this is 2017. And let's look at the perennial system treatments in the pink box here in the pink table. And if you look at crude protein, you can see the um, per I'm sorry, you can see the low treatment and the very low treatment had the highest protein levels. This is across across the season, right? Across both the cuttings. Um, and again, that makes sense. This was pure alfalfa. So we would have expected to have higher protein levels than in a mixture, right? So again, you know, your decision to add that diversity, you know, you also need to be considering, you know, what's the goal of the crop that you're growing? Are you trying to, you know, maximize protein, uh, fiber digestibility, et cetera? And you can see here over on, on the NDF side of thing as well, we have lower NDF fiber values with the pure alfalfa stand. Now, in this particular study, I saw Kurt was on here. We did not measure fiber digestibility, and certainly we would expect the grasses to have um, better fiber digestibility. But again, you know, just really making the point that combining these forages can be really critical to, you know, hedging some risk, especially as the climate is, you know, too dry, too wet, and being able to have that diversity to overcome those challenges in each year is really important. But we also have to consider, you know, what is the kind of quality that you're trying to get out of these um, forage systems and tailoring our diversity to that. Now, if you look at the cool season annuals in the blue box, again, you can see the low um, treatment had the highest crude protein. So when we started mixing things up, the crude protein went down and the fiber con concentrations went up. Now, I will say that what makes it really difficult when you do start mixing things <laughs> together that you have to pay attention to and uh, probably work with your seeds person on this, seed salesperson, is that especially with, well, any of the grasses, right? They're gonna head out at different times. And that was the challenge when we started mixing uh, triticale with, with rye um, and some of the other grass species because the rye and triticale headed out at different times. And so one was a bit more mature than the other one and it caused the quality to decline in those mixtures. So getting a handle again on the best species to mix together so that the harvest timing um, can be spot on so that you can obtain that proper quality is really, really important when you start kind of mixing all these things together. When you look down at the green table with the warm season annuals, um, we didn't see too much difference here, right? These were um, species that seem to be able to pair together a little bit better. You know, we had millets in there. Um, Sudan grass, sorghum, et cetera. They didn't seem to have that same issue that we saw, especially with the cool season grasses heading out at very different times. Right, so 2018, again, was a, a different season. Already showed this, um, just highlighting again that, you know, not in every year is, is that added diversity maybe gonna pay off, it's probably not gonna harm you. 
as you know, as we saw in 2018. But in 2017, again, having that diversity really mattered. It was the difference between potentially having enough feed and not enough feed. Right. And I think about the same results here. All right. So you know, we have a lot of folks that do do not want to till up land, um, are really, really happy with the perennial cool season forage system. And I definitely really appreciate that. And I think, you know, working through how to maintain those stands, Sarah mentioned this a bunch of times, you know, when we're trying to get new species out there into the field, um, some of the improved varieties that we're looking at or different species than, than we're seeing on many of our fields. It takes time. Sometimes it takes tillage, not always. And then it has to be maintained. Uh, they don't last forever, even though, you know, we wish they did. <laughs> Most of these legumes and grass species, you know, they, they uh, dissipate, you know, really over two to three years, you start to see things revert back, you know, to the white clover and Kentucky bluegrass, which again, if you figured out the best way to manage that on your farm and it works for you, certainly we're not advocating for you to change that, but we have heard this over and over and over again from producers that are just not getting the productivity out of fields. Um, a lot of the times because of these these climate changes, you know, just long, long periods of drought and um, or dry conditions and some of the forages out there just not being able to, to deal with that. Um, and we heard this from Patrice, you know, uh, last week, yeah, last week, you know, talking about how when they're feeding these new species, kind of renovated fields, they get more production and um, better quality. So again, this is not to say that what you're doing isn't working and I want people to do what works best for them, but just showing people you know, what's out there as well. And annuals have become a lot more popular, again, because of this kind of prolonged summer slump that we experience in different parts of the state. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, people don't experience that at all, but you move even two towns away and somebody hasn't gotten rain for two months. Um, and these annuals can help fill those gaps, you know, if you're interested in trying them. And Kurt showed this last week, you know, the quality of some of these small grain silages and these uh, warm season annuals can be an quite high, the fiber digestibility can be phenomenal. You can see this um, blue line here that shows small grain silage can really be, you know, up to 85% di digestible fiber um, over 30 hours. So again, something to consider. Here's, you know, a graph just showing where they fit in. I think everybody knows that these summer annuals can really help in, in the summer. Um, and fill those gaps when our perennial pasture or our perennial hay fields just can't keep up because it's too hot or too dry. And, you know, even at the end of the season, especially when we've had a really tough summer, those cool season forages will, you know, they'll regain some momentum, as you can see here with this green line. They'll start to regain some momentum in September, but really it's pretty short lived for the most part. So sometimes having those cool season um, annual forages, you know, oats or triticale at the end of the season can also really help um, spread out um, the forages right? It might keep you from dipping into things that are stored in the barn that you need for the winter. Old graph, I've shown this to most of you probably on this call a million times, maybe not a million, but, you know, just showing you that we evaluate warm season varieties basically every year. We look what's available in the marketplace and we put them into a trial um, and we look at yields and quality 
And this is all on our website. And if you're interested in annuals, I would encourage you to go and look and see what's performed best. This is average, excuse me, across a number of years. And, you know, I, I'm not supposed to pick favorites, but I really do like this Hay King. I'm not sure if it's even offered anymore, but it's a really uh, stellar variety that seems to produce decent yields, um, even in adverse years. And then you can see some of the other varieties. You know, a lot of people really like the millets as well. And, um, you know, some of these sorghum sedan grass crosses. If you're interested in how the different varieties perform, again, visit our website and you can pull down variety trial information, I think for the last decade. <laughs> so please use the results. Um, Sarah and I have also looked at um, cool season forages in the same way and also different ways <laughs> over the years where we've looked at things separately. We've mixed these cool season annual forages together, you know, mixing oats and peas, oats and triticale, turnips, trying to really get a sense of what's going to kind of give us the most dry matter yield and quality. And this is a little blurry. I cut it out of one of our reports. But, you know, generally for us, if you want a, a fall cool season forage to graze, um, oats seem to do the best and also produce the highest yields compared to, um, you know, brassicas, totally different crop. Um, but also, you know, annual rye grasses as an example and some of the other um, spring grains. So if you were gonna plant, you know, spring triticale or spring barley, you know, oats, tend to outperform all of those in the fall. So if you are gonna plant oats in the fall, we recommend that you do that in August, which is kind of tough because sometimes it can be really dry, but you need a good amount of time. You know, you need that 40 days, sometimes even 60 days to get about a ton of dry matter out there, right? Because it's starting to cool down. They do grow better, but you know, we don't always get the sunshine and things like that. Um, so planting these in August really can get you some decent yields and high quality feed at the end of the season. Now you can plant winter grains, but they don't tend to provide a lot of biomass come fall, um, unless you're planting them really early. Um, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get a ton a ton of biomass out there. And you can see the real difference here. These were all planted at the, at the same time. Here's triticale, a rustic winter rye, high octane triticale. They're only producing about 600. We've seen up to a thousand pounds of dry matter where your oats are generally right around a ton. And the quality of the oats um, are a lot better as well and much more leafy. Uh, people tend to be interested in annual rye grasses. Um, these are what I would call, I think, I personally think these perform best as a spring planted crop that's managed fairly intensively um, through kind of, you know, the middle of the summer. You can get a lot of biomass out of these, but planted in the fall, they don't really seem to perform as well. It is certainly variety dependent. And I circled, you know, the three varieties we looked at in this year. And you can see Kodiak um, outperformed the other two by, you know, quite a large, large margin. So understanding how the varieties are going to perform here in Vermont or around the Northeast um, is really important in terms of selecting one that's obviously going to work for you. So again, this data is all up online. Um, and you can take a look at it and, you know, hopefully make some good decisions. So this is data from this year where we were just comparing different varieties of annual rye grass, brassica and oats. And like I said, you know, your oats and your brassicas are usually producing around a ton of dry matter per acre where annual rye grass varieties just seem to be about a half a ton again, maybe about a thousand pounds or less. And not that that's not a lot of feed, but again, you know, you're putting seed in the ground, you're working things up, you want to maximize what you get out of it. 
And if you look over here, this is the 48 hour um, digestible NDF. You can see it's quite phenomenal. <laughs> it's not 30 hours, so it's difficult to compare it to the other data. But you can see they're very high, highly digestible fiber, which is why you know, Kurt was showing those last week as an opportunity to really produce some high quality forage um, and maximize, you know, milk production. You can see the oats when we compare them to the ryegrass in Nebraska in terms of um, milk yield in, in pounds per ton, the oats um, in both cases, pounds per acre, pounds per ton, do better than the other species. Now, variety selection here, I believe matters. We've looked at forage types versus grain types. So Reeves is a grain type oat. Um, and it doesn't, it's hard to see real big differences again, because this is 48 hour digestible fiber levels, but Reeves is only at about 85%, which is still really good. But the other varieties that are very forage specific were up close to 100. <laughs> so there, there definitely is a difference here um, in terms of quality, but also disease and leafiness. Um, and I would imagine palatability if you're grazing. So forage oat varieties are meant to be grown for forage. Grain varieties are meant to be grown for grain. Um, Sarah and I have also been looking at seeding rates of the oats in the fall to see if we can actually get more <laughs> if we seed higher rates. And we've done this for a couple of years now, and the answer is no. <laughs> we don't, you know, if we push the seeding rates up to a couple hundred pounds of oats per acre, we're not getting any benefit, statistically anyway, over seeding 75 pounds right? So you can save some money on seed by having a lower seeding rate. And again, the timing of the seeding is, is really important to make sure that you get that growth. But again, at 75 pounds of oat seed per acre, we didn't see any difference in yields compared to 200 or even sort of our standard, which is about 125. So we'll, we'll probably do this again, but for two years, 75 pounds was enough. Just to point you to some other research that we have, we do a lot of research with corn. I know folks know that. Um, we have conducted probably one of the longest um, standing organic corn silage variety trials in the country. So we conduct um, organic, non-GMO, and conventional corn silage trials at, up at Border View. There, there aren't a lot of organic corn seed varieties out there, but there are some, um, and we're testing the ones that, that fit well here. Um, so please take a look at that if you're looking for different varieties of corn to grow. We also have the conventional trials up online as well. I put the links here, but um, Susan dropped them in the chat as well. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about this uh, last trial, I know we're, we're at 1240, so I'll try to get through this pretty quickly. And this is a trial that I'm conducting with Carol Adair at UVM um, and her graduate student, Sarah Brickman and Lindsay Rule, who works on our team. And what I've become really interested in is uh, manure injection. And the impact that injection has on forage yields, but also on greenhouse gas emissions. So I know everybody knows this is a, a big conversation in Vermont about minimizing emissions on farms. Um, emissions come from manure and we're trying to, you know, again, look at ways to, to minimize that. So in this particular study, we were, comparing manure injection with um, just straight nitrogen fertilizer or no fertilizer with broadcasted manure with and without inhibitors. So I'm gonna take us into this a little bit deeper and uh, go over the, the nitrogen cycle a little bit. We've been getting a lot of questions on inhibitors and 
um, probably a good time to review that because inhibitors are also risk management. Um, fertilizer prices are really high and you know, uh, inhibitors can help minimize the losses that you might see um, from the environment. So our plants use or take up ammonium nitrogen or nitrates, right? They prefer nitrates, but either one of these plants will take up. They don't take up any other forms. This is it. So these are the forms that need to be in the soil solution that Sarah mentioned before that your roots need to grab onto and suck up into the roots and utilize um, to build plant biomass. Let's quickly go through the nitrogen cycle, right? When you add manure to the soil or you're plowing down legumes or any other kind of organic nitrogen source, okay, it takes soil microbes to break down this organic matter and release nitrogen um, to the microbes, but also to your plants, right? So this is called mineralization. So the microbes break down the organic matter and they release ammonium nitrogen, which again can be taken up by your plants. This can also go backwards, right? If you're putting on a calf, um, sawdust bedded calf manure, let's say, and it's really, really high in carbon, okay? microbes will need to take ammonium from the soil solution, so away from your plants, to break down that organic matter you just put on the ground. So that's a mobilization, works both directions. So nitrification is when this ammonium gets converted to nitrates, okay? So it doesn't just stay static, right? This is going on in the ground, um, throughout the season. If there's organic matter and you have a biologically active soil, microbes are going to be eating. They need to eat, right? They're animals and they're eating the organic matter. And as a byproduct, they release ammonium. Then another microbe in the soil, uh, soil bacteria, a couple spe specific ones, break that down to nitrates. And that's what your plants really want to take up. So denitrification happens when that ammonium is converted to um, N2 gas or nitrous oxide. And I think most people know that nitrous oxide is the most powerful greenhouse gas. And so we really want to minimize nitrous oxide emissions from the soil. So when does this happen? We get a lot of denitrification when there's no oxygen in the soil, okay? So if we get a lot of rain and let's say you have a heavy clay soil and it's just saturated with water, then that means there's not a lot of oxygen. So then these different bacteria that can survive under those conditions, take that ammonium and convert it to nitrous oxide and N2 gas and it's lost into the environment, okay? So the other way that we lose nitrogen besides leaching, right? So we lose nitrogen from leaching. We may lose nitrogen from denitrification that I just talked about. But what we are generally most concerned about is volatilization, right? Um, where this ammonium gas or this ammonium can actually be converted into gas by soil bacteria. And this happens on the soil surface. So when we broadcast manure that has nitrogen in it um, and the ammonium in that manure is on the surface of the ground, it is highly prone to volatilization. And this is the same for any ammonium-based fertilizer, whether it's manure or urea or ammonium sulfate, they're all susceptible to volatilization if they're sitting on the surface of the ground. Right. So the greatest losses from volatilization um, occur when you have manure or fertilizer, right? You have high pH, and then you also have high temperature soils. 
during hot, windy weather, okay? You also need moisture. So, you know, we had a dry year last year, at least up here. So the level of volatilization was likely pretty low, even though the manure or the fertilizer was on the surface of the ground. In order for that to break down, you need water. So if you have a, a moist soil and you apply fertilizer or manure and it's hot and it's windy, you can lose most of that nitrogen into the air from volatilization, right? So again, just reiterating some of the conditions where we see high volatilization. So when you have high clay soil um, or high soil organic matter, you can have more volatilization. Okay, anything where there's um, higher pHs, you could get more volatilization. So we can still see volatilization, I guess right now. <laughs> so it's not just specific to hot temperatures, although it can be far worse when temperatures are over 70 degrees. So, you know, this is right out of the UVM uh, nutrient recommendations for field crops, where we're looking at days after spreading manure on the bottom axis here. And on the left-hand axis, the amount of ammonium lost, right? So when we're broadcast applying manure, the longer after spreading, the more loss there is, right? So you can see if we're not able to incorporate the manure and we're just broadcasting it on the top, we're losing a lot of the nitrogen value of that manure, which again is why we want to try injection. One of the reasons. All right, so let me talk a little bit about inhibitors. I've been getting a lot of questions about these. There's all different types of inhibitors out there, but I will say some are very proven <laughs> and others are not. Um, so you're, you are looking for specific active ingredients. I don't believe there are any, um, not that I know of, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, that are certified organic, but, um, the, some of the most popular ones are these urease inhibitors. And what urease inhibitors do is slow down or reduce the amount of urease enzyme in the soil. So when you add um, you know, organic nitrogen or ammonium nitrogen or urea, right, um, you need this enzyme from the soil as well as water to be able to break down the compound and produce ammonium nitrogen for your plant. So if you're adding a urease inhibitor, you're essentially slowing down this process by minimizing the amount of urease in the soil. So if you're slowing the process down, the chance for volatilization goes way down. So this is a very popular type of inhibitor that's used to coat fertilizers. And the one we used in our study, we actually used on fertilizer and also in the manure to minimize the urease enzyme and slow down the production of ammonium nitrogen so that it wouldn't volatilize um, as quickly or at all. And then we also use nitri um, nitrification inhibitors and these inhibitors work by slowing down the bacteria and reducing the speed of the conversion of ammonium to nitrate, right? So these generally are also used on different types of fertilizers so that you're minimizing the chance of leaching. So again, these are proven products. They've been studied a lot, the active ingredients in particular that are listed here, and they are, you know, risk their insurance. Um, because not every year we have a lot of loss, but some years we do. And when fertilizer is over a dollar uh, per unit of nitrogen, we need to consider these. All right, so let's talk about what happened in the study. So we are trying to use manure injection on grass fields. I know this is happening in many parts of the state. 
partly, right, to reduce water pollution, to make sure the manure is going in the ground, not on the surface, not running off. We want to increase nutrient retention, like I was talking about before, more for the crops, um, less being lost in different ways. But what about greenhouse gas emissions from injection? We know when we inject into cornfields, the amount of um, N2O is, is higher, but we don't know about hay fields. So we kind of need to examine what is going on here, what the trade-offs are. So here's the experimental design. Um, so we have manure injection, manure broadcast, synthetic urea and, and no fertilizer with no inhibitor. And then we have the same treatments where we added this urease inhibitor, again, to slow down any losses from volatilization. Okay, here's this manure injection monster on our tiny little plots. <laughs> and, you know, here's just a close up picture. This is a very shallow slot. It doesn't go very deep. So there still is manure kind of on the surface. You can see it in this picture here, right? It's not totally covered up. Some pictures of the machine and the weather, as Sarah already mentioned, very dry. And so here are the results. And this was really fascinating to me. Um, when we didn't apply any fertility, we had a couple tons of yield. When we applied fertility or no fertility, but we just applied the uh, inhibitor on the surface of the ground and water, we actually saw no difference between that and the control. <clears throat> but it was also similar to the plots where we applied urea with inhibitor or just urea, which I found fascinating. If we broadcast manure, okay, we got about four tons, and we did this twice, four tons of hay yield per acre, just broadcasting the manure. When we added inhibitor, we gained another ton of yield. So we added the inhibitor into the liquid manure. And when we injected, or when we added the inhibitor with the injector, we didn't see any yield boost over broadcast manure with the inhibitor. So we're gonna continue to, to look at this because clearly um, injection is expensive, special equipment doesn't work everywhere, but if we can retain the amount of nitrogen um, by applying the inhibitor into the manure, this could be a substantial boom for yields um, and also reduce nitrogen losses. We haven't looked at all the quality data yet, so I'm, I'm not going to show too much of this. But what I want to show you is, is the N2O emissions. And this is from 2020. Um, the yield data I just showed you is from 2021. We don't have all the emissions data yet. You can see the blue line is the injection. The green line is the broadcast and the gray line is the control. So, you know, when we were injecting, um, especially around the time of injection, we would see these higher levels of nitrous oxide. And then it kind of levels out about the same once we get into the cooler, you know, cooler part of the year. So the injection was leading to higher levels of nitrous oxide um, compared to just broadcasting the manure. So we're gonna continue to look at this because um, this also doesn't separate out injection with an inhibitor. And we feel like the inhibitors can also potentially reduce um, nitrous oxide emissions, but we haven't dug into that yet. But I think, you know, adding these inhibitors into the manure is a real potential opportunity to minimize losses of nitrogen. Now I'm going to stop because just have to. <laughs> it's like time, <laughs> even though we could go on and on and on, like we said, um, because we have so much information. But I really wanted to show you the injection data. So 
you know, the injection definitely helped to conserve nitrogen and provided us with higher yields over the broadcast manure by about a ton, which is quite substantial. I think we need to crunch the numbers um, to see how that works out economically. But, you know, the other interesting piece was that if we could add inhibitors um, to the manure, could we accomplish the same thing and potentially reduce nitrous oxide emissions? So we still have a lot more to study there <laughs> um, and excited to, to keep the work going. I don't even know. We have five minutes for questions. It looks like Sarah's been um, answering them. So that is great. Okay, John um, was asking about why is there more nitrous oxide being released with injection? So remember what I said about denitrification and anaerobic? So when you pump that manure into the ground, you sort of create this anaerobic condition, right? You've got a big um, quantity of manure in one spot. And our assumption is that that's what's causing that nitrous oxide burst is that it becomes an anaerobic site. But you can see it's relatively short-lived. Um, and that's what we saw with corn as well, when we looked at nitrous oxide emissions from corn fields. So part of it might be just being able to cover up that slot better, right? Because we know that if the manure is incorporated, uh, we shouldn't have the nitrous oxide emissions to that extent. So we have some work to do. We may have some work to do on, you know, the equipment as well to make it better so that we can have injection and the benefits of that without increased greenhouse gas emissions. I think, Sarah, were there any anything that you didn't feel you could answer? It looks like you got them all. I think I got them all. I think John actually asked another question though that I didn't really have an answer to where he asked if there's a grass like native prairie grass in the west that has a very deep rooted fibrous root system that can be adapted to the northeast. I guess looking to <laughs> looking to prairie systems. Um, yeah. For well, some I, I don't see genetics. Abe on here, but Abe <laughs> Collins was working with um, gamma grass yeah. and you know, there was, there has been a lot of interest in Eastern gamma grass. It's very difficult to establish, but um, that might fit the bill for what you're talking about, John. And I think in along a similar vein, we've had questions at some of our field days too about just trying to understand if there are differences in those root systems of all of the varieties and species of grasses that were in our trials, that maybe some of that is leading to those, their ability to, you know, scavenge nutrients or, or access water and things like that as well, which obviously we, we have not been able to dig in <laughs> literally and, um, and look at any of those differences, but certainly a possibility. Yeah. Well, we have a lot more that we could share, but we're definitely, um, probably need to wrap up for today and we appreciate everybody's time wish we had time to, sh to show you all more. Um, we have, we're wrapping up the State of Soil Health Project, which I didn't really have time to, to talk about, um, but it's been fascinating to look at the quality of soil throughout Vermont and um, see how we're doing. And uh, may maybe I'll just wrap up with that, um, the results of that the state of soil health in Vermont. Here's, uh, we looked at soil, 217 soil samples from different um, production systems across Vermont. And the soil health scores on the bottom and, you know, 100 obviously is, is really good. <laughs> it's the best you can do. And then, um, you know, everything else below 100, of course, you know, score continues to go down. Healthy, high functioning uh, soils are said to be those over 70. And you can see almost all, all of our fields fell above that mark. Um, and you can see the breakdown of, you know, hay, pasture,
corn and vegetable fields and how they kind of ranked, um, you know, with our, with our study. So we'll continue to put this information out to folks um, in our reports. Oh, I'm trying to get out of here, but I can't. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, Susan. Sorry, Susan. Susan just told me share the CEU screen. So if you need your CEUs, Susan, do you have that handy? I thought I opened it, but I don't see it. If you need continuing education credits, Susan's going to put up the um, QR code, I think. He doesn't know if she can. Okay, hold on, everybody. I will dig it out and I apologize. Just got talking, talking, talking. Um, okay, here we go. I'll get that up for you. I need them too, so. All right, so if you need CCA credits, here's your credit for today. And again, we'll see you next week for a presentation on greenhouse gases specifically with Andre Brito and Horatio, I can't think, say his last name, Viege, Viege's from uh, University of Wisconsin. All right.